So without further ado, I present Stacy Schiff and John O'Connell. Well, Stacy, welcome to the Fort Washington Public Library. Uh, thank you for being here, and of course, thank you to the Friends of the Library for presenting this, uh, this event. Um, I just want to let you know, uh, let the audience know, that we will be taking some audience Q&A after, um, after Stacy and I wrap up our discussion. All right. Um, so Stacy, before we dive into the revolutionary Samuel Adams, I wanted to just uh, ask you um, a couple of more general questions, I if I might. You were working as an editor. I'm a Scorpio. Okay, very good. <laughs> so I will be careful of your sting. Um, so you were working in publishing uh, as an editor when you decide, I'm going to write a biography. Uh, and you wrote a biography of uh, Antoine de saint Exupéry. How did I do? Very extremely well. Okay, my wife told me not to try it, but but I was she going was wrong. for it. Yeah. Okay, on that one point. He, he was, <laughs> he was the. Um, uh, we have that on tape. Okay, um, she, he was the author of the Little Prince, of course. So that book was a, a Pulitzer Prize finalist. So pretty pretty good for your for your first shot at uh, at writing a book. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about what prompted you to make that move from editing to writing, and what were the sort of what were the big challenges that you faced? Sure, sure. Um, first of all, thank you to both both O'Connells. I see this is a family production, and, <laughs> and and thank you to the friends of the library, and thank you all for coming out. If, I mean, there is nothing that says democracy like voting in a library. I mean, it's just so heartwarming. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, I was a senior editor at Simon and Schuster. And I had reread Wind, Sand, and Stars. I don't know how many of you have read Wind, Sand, and Stars as adults rather than in sort of middle school French class. Um, and I was surprised by how exceptionally it, it held up. It's still one of the classics of aviation, which led me back to read early, uh, mo most of the rest of Santa Superi's work um, and realizing that there should be a biography written of him. And part of the interesting thing with him is that he spends much of his life in America um, not only during the war, but earlier as well, and writes some of his best pages while living in New York. So there had really been no biography that bridged his American years and his French years. And as an enterprising acquiring editor at Simon & Schuster, I thought, great, I'll find someone to write the book. And every time I tried to give the idea away, I hesitated, and I finally, dim though I can be, realized I wanted to write it myself. Um, so I thought I would leave publishing, write one book, and then um, go back into publishing. But the truth is that once you've written a biography, people think you're a biographer, whatever that is. And I realized that I had really loved what I had done, and I wanted to do something um, similar or different, because the next book was quite different again. And to your question about um, Pulitzer Prize finalists, I just want to go on the record as saying that I think I read in the Washington Post in mid-April of whatever year that was, 1903 or something, um, that it was a finalist for the prize. And I immediately called my then agent, as excited as anyone could possibly be, to say, you won't believe this. The book is a finalist. And without missing a beat, she said, Stacy, that means you lost. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it was more exciting for me than it was for her. <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit about those, uh, the books that followed. Your second book, Vera, uh, a biography of Mrs. Vladimir Nabokov did in fact win the Pulitzer Prize in 2010. So you lost the first one, but you won the second one. And you followed it up with a biography of Ben Franklin's Years in Paris, titled The Great Improvisation. You, then a biography of Cleopatra, a study of the Salem Witch Trials, which by the way, you discussed at the 2016 Friends of the Library Book and Author Luncheon. And of course, your most recent book, a biography of Samuel Adams, which we'll get to uh, more deeply in just a moment. But I want to ask, oh, I should mention too, I think all of those were New York Times bestsellers, which is worth, I think, worth noting. Um, but it's quite a diverse set of subjects with seemingly little in common. So how do you decide who or what you're going to write about? Um, yeah, I'm still looking for kind of the unified theory of, you know, the, the entire six or seven, whatever it is, six books. Um, and it, it so far has gone missing. 
I think this is the moment to inject um, a great ode to the wonders of an OpenStack library because what you are generally writing yourself into is the, is, the, is the absence on the shelf. And that is an absence you don't know until, until you can actually look at the shelf. And I mean, inevitably, I'm sure you all have found that the book you want to read is the one next to the one you thought you wanted to read. And very often for me, the book I end up writing is the book I am not able to reach for on the shelf. So for example, the, the, Salem, the Franklin book is probably a better example. Ben Franklin has been written about from pretty much so many, I mean, he's been written by so, by, about by, from so many angles, he's practically at this point round. I mean, every little bit of the life has been sort of pulled off and dissected. And to me, the one crucial piece that had not really been covered were his eight and a half years in France, which, is, which essentially are the years of the American Revolution and the years in which he negotiates the peace after the war, which he considered the greatest adventure and the most difficult errand of his entire life. And I realized later why those years um, were not well documented, which is largely because the research involved is most of it in France where it's very difficult to get to. And as we were just discussing, much of it is moldy and some of it is not even deciphered yet. So it's really difficult material with which to work, but there is a plent, there is just, there are bushels of material. There's a massive amount of documentation. And, and, but this was a book that didn't, to my mind, exist. Who was this Franklin whom America sent to France? What did the French make of him? And why was Franklin, alone among the founders, so well suited to that particular errand, which, which he, in which he comports himself magnificently, although he is very often, in the course of it, at odds with his colleagues, especially John Adams. Anyway, so that was really sort of a, this is a book that isn't on the shelf kind of thing. And while I was working on it, um, and really swimming in all of this unbelievably rich documentation, it several times occurred to me that I had all the documentation in the world, but could not answer basic questions about Ben Franklin, like who was the mother of his son. And that is partly what gave me the confidence, I think, to go back to an idea which was Cleopatra, an idea I had had before the Franklin idea, and started thinking maybe you can write a book about a subject where certain questions just aren't answered. Maybe it's fair, maybe it's safe to say to the reader on the page, we will never know the answer to this question. And I don't think I would have had that confidence had I not had those years um, in the French archives with Franklin. Okay. So let's turn to the revolutionary, which I absolutely loved, by the way. The revolutionary is a New York Times bestseller, and it made the 2022 best books of the year lists for, among others, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, NPR, the Boston Globe, as well as President Obama and Oprah Winfrey's book list. It's been called, and I'm quoting here, enthralling, thrilling, glorious, wildly entertaining, electrifying, and a tour de force. So let's start with this. How did you come to select Samuel Adams as a subject to turn to uh, after the Salem witch trials? I'm going to try to reconstruct it um, as well as I can, but I, I'm not sure it's an entirely rational answer. Um, I had indeed spent five or six years re reading and writing about 1692 Salem which is a very dark and eerie place. And it's a year which yields very few heroes. It's a year um, over which a great silence descends afterward because there is so much shame and regret and guilt associated with what happened over those the nine months of the, of the Salem witch trials. And, there, and very few heroes emerge, very few really sterling individuals emerge from those years, but there is one. And he was a Boston merchant named Thomas Brattle, very wealthy, um, not a Puritan, educated in London, who quietly and anonymously, at the end of the year, in the fall of 1692, writes a pamphlet essentially addressing the witchcraft judges and basically saying, a great miscarriage of justice is happening here. This is going to be a stain on the New England soul for years to come. This must come to an end. And if these aff afflicted girls who keep saying that they see witches are telling the truth, you know, they're, they're acting from their imaginations, not from what they see with their own eyes. Um, and it was an extraordinarily courageous thing to do. And I, and I kept thinking after having written the book that I was looking for somebody with Thomas Brattle's moral fiber, that I wanted someone who stood in the light after all of those years in the Salem dark, I guess. And somehow that intersected with Adams whom I knew very slightly because he had made a walk-on role in the Franklin book, where I think I had written him off in sort of half a sentence. 
And I was a little bit mortified to discover how little I knew about him. Um, I was particularly mortified because I am from Adams, Massachusetts, which was named for Samuel Adams. <laughs> so it was really embarrassing. And, and that sent me back into the archives. I actually thought I was working on a different subject and I kept going into the library, not the archives, speaking of OpenStack libraries, this is another danger. You end up where you didn't think you were going to go. And at three in the afternoon, I was sitting on the floor reading about Samuel Adams every day. And part of that was because the other founders all point to him as the prime mover of these years. Basically, if you asked in the 18th century who was responsible for the revolution, the answers would have been George Washington and Samuel Adams. So <coughs> what, got mis what went missing? What did those founders know that we don't? And what was the story there? And, that was, and then I was just sunk. So, so you and six years went by. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you start the book off with Paul Revere's ride. So can you tell us why that's the jumping off point for this book? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. That's, you know, it's very, I don't I know how often it, you all have epiphanies at three in the morning, but that was one of those nights where I woke up at three in the morning and I thought, okay, we all know that Paul Revere jumps on his horse in April of 1775 and rides madly off um, at the, at the direction of Dr. Warren in Boston, but where in the world was he going? And the very fact that I couldn't, I, I could recite the entire poem for you, but I couldn't name his destination. And so the fact that I had this, you know, verse stuck in my head, but I really didn't know the basics of the story made me realize that this was really where the book had to open because of course where Paul Revere is riding that night at the instruction of Dr. Warren is to warn Samuel Adams and John Hancock that they are about to be arrested by by British troops. And the fact that that piece of it was lost um, seemed to me to basically be the way to communicate to the reader, this whole story is lost, I'm about to completely upend, or I hope I'm going to upend your assumptions. And I also just thought, you know, how lovely to have this writer, this furious writer riding us into the narrative. So in the book, you frame Adams as having a life in three acts. You've characterized his first act as the story of someone who was, and I'm quoting here, downwardly mobile, a perfect failure until middle age, and the patron saint of late bloomers. So I, I don't know if you find that as endearing as I do. I mean, <laughs> I, what does that say about me that I find that very endearing? You know, one of my pet peeves with biography is that the biographer, it seems to me, often has an overly neat need to turn the childhood into a miniature of the life. You know, if you're going to grow up to be a general, you had to play with toy soldiers. There has to be this kind of strange resonance, looking for, teasing out these clues from the childhood that are gonna bloom into the adult you have later, where in fact, especially when you have scant evidence, I'm not really sure you can make that kind of an equation. And one of the interesting things with Adams is the very fact that he comes from a completely different milieu than the one in which he ends up. He's, he's born to a very wealthy family, um, he has two degrees from Harvard, he's educated at all the right schools, but for reasons of both um, his own aptitude, his own inclination and family misfortune, he ends up a sort of a penniless desperado. But as we all know, a person who is penniless by choice and well-born, but then chooses not to, in, not to choose a profession for himself is very different from a person who didn't have money to begin with. And that makes him a very different character. Mm -hmm. So. It just, and, and, something, and someone whom the British constantly um, have trouble assessing because they don't really understand where he's come from. But he basically never chooses a profession, lives on ideas, um, really just kind of seems to live on air until people sort of clearly are underwriting him later, and John Hancock among them underwriting his efforts later. But um, it was really chosen to live this kind of intellectualized life rather than to choose a profession which in a town like Boston, which was an industrious, hardworking, extremely aspirational town, especially in these years, was very surprising. Mm -hmm. And there was this misapprehension that the British had, right? That he was someone who was poor and was grasping for glory, where he was actually, you know, I'm not sure that you would characterize him that way, would you? That's exactly right. I think there are two misapprehensions. One is that he's this penniless desperado, he has nothing to lose, where in fact he has a great deal to lose, and he's penniless by choice, not because he's born to poverty. And the other, and this accounts for really a great deal over these years, the Crown never grasps, largely because the royal officials in Massachusetts never really spell it out, that 
this disaffection has spread, that Samuel Adams is not the only disaffected man in Massachusetts, is not the only person who's feeling somehow that his voice is not heard by the crown. For many, many years, the feeling in London is if, that Sam, if Samuel Adams and a few others could simply be arrested and sent to London and tried on sedition charges, any opposition effort would be nipped in the bud. No one realizes until it's too late how much contagion was actually at work. Yeah, and I, I do want to probe on that a little bit more as well. I do want to ask you, though, um, you, one of the things that I think the book does so well is it doesn't simply recite events and accomplishments, right? It, you really dive into who he was as a person, um, what his character was, and how that and how that drove the things that he accomplished and the people and events that he influenced. So uh, you talk about him a lot uh, and, and really display how he was a man of contrast. And maybe you could talk about the, yeah, how he was a man of contrast. So I think the shorthand for him, I mean, it, most of us think of him as a beer, period. <laughs> but but the short, once you get beyond that, I think the shorthand is a firebrand. I think right. that's really our, and I think that's probably how I wrote him off in my Franklin book. And when you actually go back and you read contemporary descriptions of him, and particularly John Adams and Thomas Jefferson's descriptions of him, you're struck over and over by the fact that they talk about his affability and his decorousness. He's a man of tremendous formality, of great congeniality. He's very patient. He's very sweet-tempered. Um, he's very secure in his beliefs. He always believes he's on the side of the angels. He's a man of tremendous piety but he's clearly temperate and prudent. He's not at all this kind of hot-headed fanatic um, as he has gone down in history. And that accounts for, to my mind, for a great deal of his ability to sway men's minds and to insinuate himself and his ideas into their thinking because he isn't someone who comes on strong. He's someone who, who tends to sort of wrangle, um, I, to gently wrangle people, although there is a certain amount of, you know, pulling people's, you know, pressing shoulders and pressing thumbs into shoulders later on. Mm -hmm. But there's also the element, right, uh, of, of Adams as the propagandist and, and, and the master schemer. And, and when you think about fake news, I think you could say <laughs> that, you know, Samuel Adams had kind of mastered that art in some ways, can you say? So, so one of the most difficult parts of writing the book, um, and maybe one of the more rewarding parts at the same time, is that Adams is writing really from the 1760s. From the 1760s, he's understood in Boston to have one of the most fluent pens around. So in fact, the first, um, the first piece of correspondence from the Massachusetts House of Representatives back to London in protest to the Stamp Act is written by Samuel Adams, who is not even yet a member of the Massachusetts House, but he's asked to do it because he's so well known for his ability to put a sentence together. Over the next decade, um, he is, weekly, assiduously, nonstop, often throughout the night, writing articles for the press. So he really is dominating the columns of the, the Boston Gazette and the Boston Evening Post. The style of the day, however, was to write um, with unsigned pieces or with pieces that were signed with pseudonyms. So then, of course, the question began, became, which of these many pieces were written by Adams and which were not? And and I, I've come up with about 30 or 32 pseudonyms. I think if you put an AI you know, mind to it, you probably would discover more. Um, just to begin, I had pseudonyms that had been identified by his great-grandson in a work he published in, in the 19th century. I had some pseudonyms that had been uncovered by a previous biographer who actually never published her biography of Samuel Adams, but whose research materials I had. And then I had the most astonishing um, resource, which is the following. Um, in 1765, a Boston hardware store owner named Harbottle Door realized that, some, that history was about to be made. And he started to keep a collection of Boston newspapers. And every week, um, he would annotate those newspapers. His name, his glorious name was Harbottle Door. And Harbottle Door had this collection of newspapers which he, on which he wrote in the margins, for which he wrote an index, on which he, co he commented on all of them. And they are preserved today in the, in the Massachusetts Historical Society. And so thanks to Harbottle Door, we also know which columns are Adams's because Harbottle Door was very much applauding Samuel Adams in the margins while crucifying the royal governor, Thomas Hutchinson, in the margins. So, he, so from him, too, we have a certain number of pseudonyms. And then there are others where certain pieces clearly recycle things that Adams had said in his letters, and so I'm assuming that those were definitely his pieces as well. Mm -hmm. 
So speaking of Hutchinson, let's, let's stay with that. He, the, he is an important figure in the book. Um, and one of the very interesting threads, I think, is the years-long battle that Samuel Adams has with Hutchinson. I, so I almost felt for Hutchinson at some points in the book. It was sort of like the road runner and Wile E. Coyote. And um, Hutchinson was, was Wile E. Coyote, too, um, unfortunately for him. Can you talk about the importance of that relationship and how they were, in some ways, sort of the, the polar opposites of each other? Yeah, I mean, Hutchinson is the, is the perfect anti-hero <coughs> here. And I, and I do, I feel tremendous compassion for him as well. I, I think I over-identified, in fact, with Thomas Hutchinson. Hutchinson and Adams come from very similar backgrounds. Hutchinson's family is wealthier. Um, he's a little bit older, but they have gone to the same schools. They have garnered the same degrees. They know the same people. The difference is that Thomas Hutchinson, from a very early age, um, has, really been, has really attracted all sorts of Massachusetts titles to himself. So that by the early 1760s, he is active in at least two, if not three, branches of Massachusetts government, something which strikes both John and Samuel Adams as thoroughly wrong. And in fact, from the time that the two Adams cousins first meet, which doesn't appear to have been much before the early 1760s, they agree on precisely one thing, and that's not about the overreach of the crown, it is about the, their disaffection for Thomas Hutchinson. So there's, there's already this animosity on Samuel Adams's part about a man who he sees as grasping and overly ambitious and somewhat corrupt, although the truth of the matter is, from Thomas Hutchinson's perspective, um, he's a very conscientious, immensely diligent public servant. He is, for all of these years, either the lieutenant governor or the royal governor. He's, he has nothing but Massachusetts's best interests at heart. Throughout these years, he's actually writing a history of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, which is really kind of interesting because he's writing about events in which he then plays a role, which tells you something about how many titles he holds. He has to write about himself in the third person because otherwise the story doesn't really make sense. Um, but but he, he's so much the victim of these years partly because of the very fact that he is so much at the center of power. And the best illustration I think of that is um, if you look at the East India Company tea when it's sent to America in 1773, when it's sent to Boston in 1773, it is consigned to six individuals and only those six individuals will be allowed to sell that tea Two of them are Thomas Hutchinson's sons, two of them are his relatives, and two of them are his best friends. So that tells you something about this narrow elite and the hold that they seem to have on power and how much resentment that churns up among, Adam, among both Adamses and their friends. And in a funny way, that, that stands in miniature to their resentment against the crown. They really have this very, um, this, this example of kind of overreach um, and str of a stranglehold very much at close at hand. So t two of the events pr uh, leading up to the revolution that we, that we read about and are taught in, in grammar school, I think, at this point, the Boston Tea Party and the Boston Massacre. Um, can you talk about Adam's role um, or connection to each of those events? I, I think with the massacre, massacre is, seven, is March of 1770. Um, you could talk about Adams on either side of it. It isn't really a massacre, and by the way, that's an expression that evidently Adams himself invented. Um, so soldiers fire on civilians and kill five men. Um, Adams had done all in his power to incite the people of Boston against those troops. Troops arrived in 1768. Um, from that moment until March of 1770, Adams is very busy um, with a sort of new syndicate that he and his friends found churning out um, mostly false accounts of, um, of various British aggressions upon the citizens of Boston, which very much incite the town. So to some extent, the temperature in Boston um, in that very cool season of March of 1770 is one that Adams has done a great deal to elevate. After the soldiers fire um, and Boston appears to have been martyred at the hands of these marauding troops, Adams does everything he can to exploit the incident. And that includes making sure that Paul Revere, um, in, the, in the engraving some of you may remember, depicts it um, with you know, people firing out of the customs house and with the citizens of Boston you know, huddled and innocent on one side of the frame and the, the, the soldiers fiercely firing from the other. It was much more of a melee. The people of Boston were much more complicit. Um, it involves sending out all kinds of propaganda, taking depositions for people, and really amplifying what had just happened, how, he, how Adams argues can innocent civilians be said to have been the ones who were 
um, guilty here when they were, they were in the presence of, of troops who had munitions. Um, and then after the trial, which John Adams will, um, will argue, and in which John Adams will see that all but two of the soldiers are exonerated, Samuel Adams then, for six months, relitigates the entire incident in the press under a pseudonym. So he's done everything he can to both amplify it, to both provoke it, to amplify it, and then to advertise a very different result from the legal, from the legal result, which John um, manages to secure. Um, in the Boston Tea Party, I think he's probably much more complicit. Um, there's a letter he writes to a correspondent in London about a mo as the tea is making its way to Boston, in which he basically says, unless something, unless something serious happens, I'll be writing you soon on a non-trifling matter. And that non-trifling matter would seem to be the 342 chests of tea disappearing into the water. Um, no one in Bo thousands of people in Boston were on the wharf that December night as the disguised men shattered open the chests and poured the contents into the, into the water. The next day, no one in Boston had seen a thing. <laughs> um, so it's very unclear who exactly these perpetrators were. We know Adams was not among them. We know he was very conspicuously back at the Old South Meeting House where he'd been running meetings to discuss what should be done about the tea. But the equation between accepting that tea and accepting the sovereignty of Parliament was an equation which Adams had himself really forced. And that was why, um, especially in Massachusetts anyway, there was this resistance to the tea. Afterwards, 12 men, several weeks afterwards, are deposed in London, so far away from Boston and in a place where they can safely speak their minds. And those 12 men in those depositions, all of them very specifically say that Adams was the prime mover or among the prime movers in the days preceding the destruction of the tea. So it's pretty clear, Thomas Hutchinson the next day will say Adams was never in greater glory than he was that day. Um, it's Adams who afterward will advertise this act of vandalism really as a noble defense of liberties. So I think it's pretty easy to see his hands, his fingerprints um, all over the Boston Tea Party. So yes, he was, he was in his glory, but it, at various times during this period, he was in real danger. I think you alluded to that earlier of losing his liberty or losing his life. And there were those who advocated on the British side for dealing with him much more harshly than Hutchinson and others ultimately dealt with him. The so number, can you talk about yeah, that? Yeah, the number of requests that go back to London from Francis Bernard, the first royal governor, and then Thomas Hutchinson. I mean, I don't think I've ever counted, but regularly there's this, um, there's this, this chorus of, could you please just arrest him already? Here are five things from the press this week. Aren't, doesn't this qualify as sedition? If you could just do away with this, you know, rapscallion, all would return to normal. And what ultimately happens is, or what starts to happen is that as Adams becomes more and more prominent, it becomes more and more difficult to arrest him. And that is actually the problem that General Thomas Gage will encounter when finally, after the, after the destruction of the tea, he is dispatched to Boston. He assumes his first act um, will be to arrest and extradite Samuel Adams. And slowly he comes to realize that to do that it would be to detonate a revolution or at least some kind of rebellion. And so he's, he comes very much with that fe feeling that that's the mandate and he quickly realizes he's missed his moment. Mm -hmm. So th th in those early days, the 1760s into the early 1770s, I think the mindset among um, all of the leaders in Massachusetts and elsewhere was we're protesting or resisting some of the acts of the British government. At some point, the zeitgeist kind of shifts to American independence. So well, when do you think that happened with Samuel Adams and what did that transformation in his outlook, how, how did it influence others? Yeah, that's, that's the million dollar question. For, for most of this time, um, the real grievance, and it really is a grievance, is our voices are unheard in London. London is deaf to our complaints. Um, London is clueless as to what even exists in terms of colonial life. Um, there's a tremendous confusion about what the government, how the two governments relate to each other. At one point, Samuel Adams even says in a, in a in one of his columns, since the two governments are identical, why shouldn't we? Why don't we tax you instead of you taxing us? <laughs> um, the feeling is that, as he puts it elsewhere, the colonists are as um, able to voice their opinions, you know, as able to voice their opinions in London as they would be if they were living in China. Um, there's just this sense of 
tone deafness in London, and there's a complete cluelessness in London, in fact, about the dis as I mentioned, about the disaffection in the colonies. No one mentions a word like independence really much before 1776 because, as someone warns the New England men when they make their way finally to Philadelphia, to mention that word is to become a leper. It's far too toxic a word. It's far too explosive an idea. The, the general feeling among earlier historians has been that in 1768, when those troops first marched into Boston, Samuel Adams did, set his mind on independence. And when Thomas Hutchinson goes back to London after the destruction of the tea in 1774, he meets with King George, and he will say that Samuel, he'll identify Samuel Adams as the first person to advocate for independence. But I don't actually see any indication of that in the record. I certainly don't see it as early as 1768. Obviously, it's nothing he would have committed to paper even if he spoke it aloud. But as late as, as 1775, when men are assembling in Philadelphia, none of the founders mentioned the word independence. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to see where the, the idea of redress turns into what the, the real insistence on rupture. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you referenced a little bit the, uh, the misapprehension that the British had about Samuel Adams himself and what motivated him. But you also talk about in the book uh, a larger misapprehension that the British have just about the colonies and about, and about the colonists. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I, I love researching this part because the letters from London are like, you know, is Boston the East Indies or the West Indies? Um, you know, there was absolutely, um, it, it's just astonishing. There were letters accumulating from the colonies that had been stashed in a cupboard in London that no one had ever read. And you know, you have to feel for the royal governors because they're writing constantly. They're, you know, it's, it's their job to be keeping London abreast of what is happening, especially in Massachusetts where things were particularly restive. They're writing constantly in great detail and really nobody seems to be reading their dispatches. Um, so there's this general sense of the two being completely out of sync and everyone in London paying much more attention to you know, whose royal mistress was doing what than they were to what was actually happening in Boston mm -hmm. or Philadelphia in these years. So dur during the period uh, leading up to the revolution uh, and the events that we've talked about, uh, Boston was a real hot spot. But um, my sense is that the colonies did not see themselves as, as sort of a unified group, but, but each of the colonies essentially saw themselves as separate entities. And you talk about in the book how um, Samuel Adams wired the colonies for revolution, I think is the, is, is, is the quote, and was really a prime mover in bringing them together and, and, and becoming much more of one mind. Um, how, how did he do that? I, th I think that's actually his great, you, you said it better than I did, and I think it's actually his greatest achievement is to bring everyone onto the same page. It's something that you can see him doing or attempting to do for years. He's constantly writing to Rhode Island and saying, could you put this idea forward because everyone will pay more attention if you do. You know, people know that we in Massachusetts are a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. hot-headed. Um, but he ultimately doesn't get what becomes the successful idea off the ground until 1772. And yet again, it is a British misstep that allows him to do so. At one point, the Crown decides that it will pay the salaries of the American justices, of the colonial justices. And once the idea that justices are no longer to be independent but in, in thrall to the Crown arrives, there's tremendous um, discontent. And Adams finally gets off the ground an idea he had had a little bit earlier, which he calls Committees of Correspondence, which sounds ridiculously anodyne, and it may have had that name for a reason. Because what they really were were just little committees in every town and hamlet of New England, which were meant to essentially voice and survey American rights and privileges. So they were meant to basically articulate those rights and speak up if ever those rights were infringed upon in any way. And with them, Adams basically manages to arrange a common vocabulary as well as a common grammar because these committees start corresponding with each other. Ultimately, when he hears about this, Thomas Hutchinson thinks it's the most ridiculous thing he's ever heard. They're just snorts of derision. How could this possibly be a good idea? And then within minutes, there are 20 such committees, and then there are 60, and then there are 120. And, and suddenly, it does seem as if the colonies are wired in a way that they had not been before. And I think there it's important to remember how disparate these colonies were from each other. I mean, Georgia and Massachusetts are communicating via London. Um, a letter takes forever, or had taken forever and, and throughout these years, 
And these are people, even when the first Congresses assemble, these are men who are very, very different in their backgrounds, in their religions, in their bearings. They divide a dollar into different, into different units. They speak different languages, practically. There's a real different cultural difference here. And it's Adams's great achievement, really, to have brought everyone onto the same page at approximately the same time with a grammar that makes sense to them all. And then we get to the first Continental Congress and, and then subsequently, obviously, the second. And, and it felt like, in some ways, that's where the baton began to be passed. Would you, would, would you agree with that? I think that's where Act Three begins, exactly. Mm -hmm. I think that the opposition effort is Adams at his finest. Um, there's a great deal of negotiation. Congress is hard to write about because um, the delegates are sworn to secrecy and there's very little on the page. And very little of what we would want to know is on the page. So you're really kind of driving a little bit in the dark, but it's very clear from accounts that Adams is working in the back rooms, that certain things that happen in Congress happen because Adams has arranged them out of doors and then they have happened exactly according to his plans. But you don't see a lot of him in that room. He's in Congress for eight years. He's there for a really long time. But other than the, um, the sort of coalition building, you do not see his fingerprint as you had in Boston mm -hmm. earlier. There are a couple of relationships that sort of make their way or through the book as being incredibly important. So I'll just mention a couple of them and maybe you can just elaborate. One, one is uh, James Otis, who we don't really hear very much about when, when we study American history, but who was, I know he and Adams were very close and, and they were very influential on each other. And then there was the relationship with John Hancock, which you alluded to uh, at, at the beginning. Maybe you could talk about those two relationships and how important they were. So Otis is younger than Adams, um, but Adams is mentor, essentially. And Otis is this fiery, I mean, really pyrotechnic speaker, brilliant legal mind, famously argued the, the case of the writs of assistance, a case that he loses, but loses with tremendous eloquence. Along with his genius, however, um, is a large helping of some kind of mental illness. And fairly early on, at least by, before 1768, he, is, his, he, he has begun physically or mentally to disintegrate in some way. And he's very mercurial. One day he might drive to Thomas Hutchinson's house and, and apologize for all of the trouble he's caused, and another day he might fire pistols out his window. And at one point he's carted off in what sounds like an 18th century straitjacket for his own good. Um, so he's suffering from this debilitating, it may have been something like schizophrenia. Sometimes he's perfectly in possession of his faculties, other times he has this volcanic temper. And Adams, you can see, trying very hard to continue to fold him into these opposition efforts, to continue to, be compa to act compassionately toward him. At one point he says, there are tears in my eyes when I write about the state J that Otis is in, but also having to insulate the efforts from someone who can't any longer be trusted, basically with the car keys, because it's unclear what he's going to do next. Um, and, he, and, and basically Otis falls off the stage, and he's part of the committees of correspondence, and I think that's the last point where mm -hmm. we see him. Um, with Hancock, there's a very real, it's a really interesting relationship. Adams is an extremely modest man. Um, as I said, he has no money. He prides himself, if he prides himself on anything, on the fact that he has no money. He's really interested in, in all the essentials and in ideas. John Hancock, a man of a tremendous fortune, is very interested in admiration and applause. Um, he has the best wardrobe in Boston. Um, he has the most beautiful carriage in Boston and one of the most beautiful homes. And he really relishes the adoration. So Adams, um, Hancock is younger. Adams realizes that by recruiting John Hancock to the cause, he is both enlisting Hancock's great fortune and he's pleasing John Hancock with the attention that will come his way. And that's a, it's a, it's a perfectly honest calculation. It works out exactly as Adams had anticipated, but what he doesn't anticipate um, is how much Hancock will come to resent him for various reasons. And it's a really, they're the odd couple of the founders. It's a very on again, off again relationship over the next years. At one point, Hancock will swear to Thomas Hutchinson that he intends never again to speak to Samuel Adams. Um, when Paul Revere comes to warn the two of their arrest, they will be crouching together um, in a swamp for an evening, um, worrying about their lives. They will then fall out again within, within two years. And it's really John Hancock who ultimately will poison the waters in Boston so that when Samuel Adams returns to Boston after his years in Congress, 
He's persona non grata because of what John Hancock has done to his reputation. Well, let, let's talk a little bit more about that, of what you call the third act, right? Um, so the, the Shining Act, Act Two, 12 to 15 years, yeah. great influence, a, a mover uh, in, the, in terms of the American Revolution. H how, do we, how do we get from there to that third, that very long, right, 25 year third act? And, and so let's talk a little bit about what that constituted that third act. Yeah, so the third act is not the Shining Act, which is why the end of the book is really short. Um, because it, it's a really, I mean, he, as we say, Adams loses his effectiveness to some level after the years in Congress. And a French diplomat will at one point say that Adams needed an opposition effort. He always had to oppose something. And if he couldn't oppose something, he somehow lost his effectiveness. And in a way, that could be an explanation. I tend to write things down more to the fact that he's actually older at this point. I mean, he's, we, we forget that Franklin is the oldest, but Adams is quite a bit older as well. He's old enough to be Hamilton or Madison's father. Um, there's a generational difference there, and his health is not great. Mm -hmm. But he goes back to Boston. He is largely a relic of the kind of pre-revolutionary days. Um, he's kind of the first port of call if you were coming to research the revolution. You, you immediately called on Samuel Adams. But he's also harking back to a time before the revolution. He's not a federalist. He's not really an American in that full-fledged sense of the term. He's really still a New Englander. And he's really still reaching back to what he called the sort of ancient purity of principles, which, which he saw as the essence of republicanism, and which do not, to his mind, necessarily apply to the country as a whole. So he's really sort of a man of the past who outlives himself in those years. And, and also, in those years, Hancock's star is rising and he's burying Adams, right? I mean, not literally, yeah, but yeah. figuratively. Yeah, Hancock, Hancock is the one who promotes a rumor that Adams had been involved in the Conway Cabal, the cabal that was meant to, un, to upend George Washington, in which Adams had no participation whatsoever. But Adams, because he lives so long, um, is in the thankless position of actually reading the first histories of the revolution. And so you actually have an account of him reading the first history that is written and reading about activities in which he is said to have participated, in which he played no role whatsoever. And one of those is he reads that, as Hancock asserted, he had been involved in this plot against George Washington. Right. So Thomas Jefferson is called, or called Adams, the earliest, most active, and persevering man of the revolution. On his death, Adams was eulogized as the father of the American Revolution. So why is it? that he's hardly ever mentioned today when we talk about the American Revolution. Yeah, I think there are, I think there are a lot of reasons. John Hancock is on the list, certainly. Um, I think to a great extent, after the revolution, you don't want the revolutionaries around. You want, you're building institutions and you want to shunt the revolutionaries off stage. I think that ideally you want, or in, our, in the case of the American Revolution, you want the ideals to shine forth. You don't want the years of, kind of street protest in Boston, the destruction of the tea, um, to overshadow the gleaming ideals of Thomas Jefferson. So I think you want to play down the, um, the protest movement in which Adams was so complicit. And, and I think, too, he's, um, he's himself to blame to a great extent. John Adams will say to Samuel, after the war, you need to collect your papers. You need to basically claim your, pl your, pa your place amid posterity. And Samuel Adams never does it. He never collects his papers. He never makes any effort whatsoever um, to address the past. And he leaves that, he, he basically feels that he only answers to one judge, and that is the divine one. He leaves the rest to history. And you know, comparing him to someone like John Adams, who was always writing for posterity and always had an eye um, on how the history was going to be written, he essentially winds up writing himself out of the story. Okay. So I wanna, I wanna go back to something you mentioned right near the beginning, which is, the work you've done in libraries and uh, and how that has stimulated what you've chosen uh, as your as your subjects over over the years. Can you talk about since we're in a public library? Can you talk about what public libraries have meant to you oh personally gosh. and professionally? Pretty much everything. I mean, I, I, first of all, this is this is the kind of building in which I feel I should live. You know, if, is there, is, if there's a residence program here, please let me know. Um, there was one year in which I had a fellowship where you were allowed to have a library, an office in the New York Public Library, which I referred to as spa library. And I think I got more work done, in, it was during the Franklin book, and I got more work done in that single year 
than in any other year. I, I mean, I'm that, I'm that person you see kind of like sitting on the floor reading, you know, at three in the afternoon, unable to leave um, the stacks because that's sort of, it feels like home in so many ways. But it's, I mean, it, again, it's the miracle of what isn't on the shelf as much as what is. Mm -hmm. Um, and just feeling that somehow this is the this is the fairy dust from which these kind of books get built. So, so you mentioned the Franklin book. I just want to give a shout out to the fact that Apple TV mm -hmm. is doing a miniseries based on your book. Do you want to right. talk about that um, just for a moment? Sure. It's an yes because it's so unlike sitting in the in the library collecting dust, <laughs> which is what I normally do. Um, it's an eight-part series, and I think it's going to be called Franklin, and it comes out in March or April, and. Um, starring as Benjamin Franklin is Michael Douglas. So there you go. So stay, put it on your <laughs> list. All right, I want to do a quick lightning round and then we're going to get to some okay. audience questions, okay? So book that most influenced you, maybe the one you mentioned, but. Wow, there's this very strange book by S Harold Nicholson called Some People, which is a fictionalized set of biographies. It's a tiny little book. I think I've read that book more times than I can possibly count just because of the beauty of the language. Um, I don't know, there are so many biographies that probably influenced me. Nancy, Nancy Mitford's book on Voltaire and Madame du Chatelet was a big influence, probably. Favorite author? Whoa. Hilary Mantel, probably. Okay, very good. Um, I had to pick someone who wasn't alive because I don't want to offend right, anybody. That's, I, th I think that's a good strategy, It's the only actually. time I've ever been happy she was dead. <laughs> okay, so you grew up in Massachusetts, you went to college in Massachusetts, you live in New York. Red Sox or Yankees? That's, uh, that's just not a fair question. Keep going. <laughs> All right. Um, hobby or pursuit about which you're most passionate? God, do Besides I have a Besides writing hobby? by, I don't know, do you? Oh my God, this is like the family joke. I have no, my, okay. I, have, I have a cat. Okay, I'm obsessed with my cat, okay? <laughs> Very good. Favorite music composer or group? Well, I wrote this book listening to Beethoven and almost only, well, that's not true. Bach and Beethoven only. And so those would probably be the two. Okay. But it's interesting, when I was writing Cleopatra, I could only listen to opera, which maybe is germane to the subject. <laughs> okay, favorite place in the world? Excuse me, where are we? Okay, <laughs> that's what I thought your answer Absolutely. was. Absolutely, Washington. I wanted to hear you say it, <laughs> yeah. Um, your first call when you found out you won the Pulitzer Prize. Okay, so I called my husband. I was nine months pregnant, um, and I needed to get him out of a meeting but not have him think that something horrible had happened, which is a tricky thing to do, right, when you're nine months pregnant. So I had to sort of say, nothing went wrong, please get him out of the meeting, and he got on the phone, he was very aggravated that I pulled him out of a meeting, and so I, I didn't know how, what to say, so I said, I think I might have won a Pulitzer Prize. And he said, well, did you or didn't you? <laughs> very good. Ketchup or mustard? Mustard. Yeah, me too. Okay, yeah. three dinner guests, alive or dead. Oh my God, this is really hard. Can Hilary Mantel come? Can Virginia Woolf come? And to your dinner. maybe Ella Fitzgerald. Oh, I like that. All right, very good. So with that, oh. Daisy Schiff, thank you. That was hard. Um, thank you. All right. Lights up. So if you have, so we're gonna we're gonna do we're gonna do some audience Q and A. So yes, Je Jeff Zay has the microphone. So if you would raise your hand and wait yep, for I'll the mic. I'll ask you to raise your hand if you have a question. Those on Zoom, if you, you can type your question and we'll take some questions from there. We'll get to as right. many as we can. I think this is the first hand I it's saw. It's so nice that we can see you now. Yes. Hi, I was wondering if you have selected your next subject for a biography. <laughs> Are you planted here by my publisher? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's interesting you should ask. Um, I have two ideas, I'm not gonna tell you what they are. One is 18th century, one is 20th century. Um, I cannot decide, I, co I could easily write either one. I keep meaning to talk to my agent about it, but the longer I put after that conversation, the longer I can go without having to write another book, so I haven't <laughs> done it. I'm supposed to see him next week. There is something blissful about working on a subject whose materials are typewritten. I, like 18th century handwriting, I mean, I just feel like I've done my dues. Um, and for this book, as you can imagine, I really read all of those years worth of Boston Gazette and Boston Evening Post. And like little tiny 18th century newsprint, I, after a long day in the archive, it's like and you've got archive dust just you know stuck under your fingernails. I kind of don't want to go back there. On the other hand, this 18th century subject is just screaming at me. So I, I don't know, I'll, I'll let you know in a week or so. Just email me. <laughs> Another question. Ms. Schiff, uh, your biographies are a national treasure, so thank so you. Sweet, thank you. There are a lot of different uh, 
interpretive historical schools in looking at the American Revolution? Do you come at it through one or two of those prisms? I'm just trying to get a sense of, you know, when I, when I read your biography, you know, how you viewed Sam Adams in the context of the events. It's a great question. I, I tend to want to know about all the schools and belong to none of them. And this was said by an old New Yorker writer where he basically said the secret of really you know, great narrative writing was strong curiosity and weak affiliations. And I feel like that's really crucial, that the fact that I go at a subject without an agenda, without a school, without a philosophy, means that I'm much more open to what I'm reading. And you know, I've had this conversation with other people who've done the opposite, but I feel like you're, in that case, you're actually kind of you know, square pegging and round holing throughout your research. And constantly I find that I'm in the midst of writing about something and my mind changes, or I see something which completely subverts what I thought I had believed. And I wouldn't really want to write any other way because I really do want the, uh, want the documentation to be what's determining the story and not my preconceived notions. So I, for the most part, try to stay away from those schools. I will say with this book, I came very close to feeling that he's so underrated and he's so underexplored that there is almost like a great man feeling to it because he and the moment really do meet in this strangely combustive and incredibly effective way. But that's only for those 12 years and then it's kind of over. Let's see some other hands here. Yeah, so um, thank you very much. It's only a quarter through the book, but I'm enjoying it very much. Um, so he dies in the end. <laughs> I can't believe you spoiled it. Now I, now I don't have to read it. I can read it. <laughs> um, so he's very pious, but he's also, as I guess, I don't know what you said about him, or just there was Hutchinson, a rapscallion. So how do you think you reconcile the being virtuous principles, but then doing a lot of things that people would think were underhanded? So well said. I think that always he felt he was on the side of the angels. And I think what we would consider, what Hutchinson considered, Hutchinson at one point calls him that Machiavelli of chaos. I don't think for a second Samuel Adams thought of himself as a Machiavelli of chaos. I think he thought of himself as pure-minded and ultimately pious and essentially you know, a hand servant to republicanism. And over and over he will insist on this. You know, he will insist on the fact that the people should be the ones who are in control of their own destiny, not their elected officials or not the little cronies of Thomas Hutchinson. He always insists on the fact that there are two fundamentals to democracy, education, and virtue. The rest of it could fall away. Those were the two pillars on which, on which democracy basically rested. And I think he always felt that those were the things on which he insisted. It's in the all's fair and love and war kind of way, he's obviously upending the apple cart. But I think he's feeling, his feeling here is that there were too many things that were unfair, unjustified, and unsaid, and therefore what, that he's having to sort of gouge away at those things. So I, I think he always felt he was on the side of the angels, even when he was relitigating the Boston Massacre case. Do you think he felt challenged by that? Challenged by what, sorry? There is no evidence that he ever felt anything but serenely confident about what he was doing. And I think the serenity is the thing I would stress. I mean, this is a man who, as, as you know, was extremely pious and who really felt that these ideas were fundamentally consistent with his religious beliefs. I mean, the idea that there was a church without a bishop was the same as the fact that there was a government without a king. He really felt that the people were owed everything, that this tiny circle of self-serving officials were strangling them in some way, and what he was doing was liberating the people from that kind of yoke. <coughs> Another hand. I, I just thought it was interesting that John Adams defended the soldiers at the Boston Massacre, and even though they had killed five Bostonians, Samuel Adams forgave him and didn't resent it. I, I just find that very magnanimous and uh, an indication of what kind of person he was. Um, it's, a, it's a little more complicated than that, and I'm, and I'm glad you bring it up. It's almost impossible to believe that John would have been chosen to defend the soldiers if Samuel hadn't been instrumental in getting him to do so. So because Samuel Adams had helped, had encouraged other lawyers to take the case, so he almost certainly behind the scenes also enlisted John. 
the thinking there is that if John Adams were going to try the case, certain things that shouldn't come out would remain unknown because John would make sure they didn't come out. So it was better to have a friend of the opposition effort trying the case. Um, there's a fascinating interaction between the two of them a little bit later. One of the things that Samuel Adams does to keep the Boston Massacre on everyone's minds is to arrange for a Boston Massacre oration, which would be held annually in Boston. And it was this immensely well-attended, very mawkish affair um, that Boston, an oration would be delivered, which would be published throughout the colonies to remind people of British oppression. And Adams is very much the person who helped enlist the speaker for that oration. And I think it's two years or three years after the massacre, he has the slightly, the really genius idea of asking John to do it, which would have been brilliant because here's the person who got the soldiers off, basically talking about the violence of the soldiers. In any case, John resists him, and there's a wonderful paragraph in John Adams' diary in which he's trying to say no to his cousin Samuel, and it's not easy. And, he, and you, know, you can see Samuel pummeling him with reasons, and John saying, basically, nothing I have ever done in my professional life has been as difficult to defend, has cost me as much of, in terms of reputation, has got me spat out upon the street as defending the soldiers. So it was clearly a hardship posting for John to have, to have been on the side of the defense. And he doesn't give the Boston Massacre oration, he gets off the hook. I'm just gonna check in with the folks on Zoom. No, no questions up there. Okay, we have a, you got a question? Um, thank you for your presentation, it was very nice. In terms of historical perspective, uh, could you see any correlation uh, between Samuel Adams and Aaron Barr as we understand that Aaron Barr has some uh, tumultuous uh, relations with George Washington and, and the people around him at that time. Um, is the question about Aaron Burr? Yes. Um, yeah, I, you know, it's very, again, this is where the historical record fails us. Even between Washington and Adams, there's very little material. There's one wonderful point where, where Washington goes to Boston and is shown around town by John Adams and Samuel Adams. In fact, John Hancock petulantly refuses to come out because he thinks that Washington should call first on him and not be on Washington, so they, they kind of have this standoff. <laughs> but you have, Washington, you have Washington and the Adams men together. As you have them together a few times in Congress, otherwise we have almost nothing between George Washington and Samuel Adams, so it's really hard to say. You, uh, Stacy. So I think one other uh, perhaps character in this whole story is the city of Boston. Um, as someone who comes from Massachusetts, um, can you talk a little bit about that in terms of what role, like could the revolution have started anywhere else but in Boston? Um, I'm so glad you say that because it makes me feel justified in having read all those Boston newspapers. <laughs> I feel like I could tell you exactly what the prices were in Boston, how much a runaway slave was going to cost you, and how much a pineapple was going to cost you. I mean, it really is a character in the story. Um, Ma the, Mas the Massachusetts men are way out, front, out in front of everyone else, um, something that they are reminded of as they make their way to the First Continental Congress, and as they make their way south, people start to say to them, you know, you might want to be careful about what you say because you are known throughout the rest of the colonies as kind of a bunch of Visigoths and, and Vandals. Um, and people are afraid that New England is going to take over the rest of the colonies just as they're afraid of the crown. Um, but the answer is that Boston is out front for a couple of reasons. One is that Calvinism, that Puritanism, has made them more independent-minded. One is that Boston um, has more newspapers than any other town in America. There are for all of these years, either five or six, depending on when you're talking, newspapers in Boston, and you have an immensely literate population, which you always had in Massachusetts because you had to read in order to pray. So you have a very literate population women and children are also reading the newspapers. So you're able to disseminate ideas with a force that you couldn't have elsewhere. And in addition to all of that, you have in Massachusetts an economy in decline. The, the, the shipbuilding industries have begun to decamp for New York and Philadelphia. And you have this explosion in newspapers at a time when you have an economy in decline. And then lastly, I would say that in Boston particularly, um, in Massachusetts particularly, you have a government that is very independent. The, the co colonial governments are not all the same, and by charter, the Massachusetts government is more independent. It has more control over its governing council, which Samuel Adams will do his best to detach, in fact, from the governor, so that the governor's council no longer really helps the governor. 
Um, and nowhere in the Massachusetts Charter is the word parliament mentioned, which is part of the, much of the confusion of these years because the question of the king is clearly an authority over the colonies, but is parliament? And that's a question which even the Massachusetts written document does not clarify. Thank you for coming, Stacy. It's uh, great to hear you. Um, when I picked up the flyer and saw that you were going to be here today, I, uh, I went to my shelf and, and pulled off um, your Cleopatra um, and started to reread. In, in the beginning, you talk about the conundrum of writing history of how little we know. You talk about all the reams of things that you read about John Adams. But for every piece of information, there must be 10 or 15 things that we'll never know, like who was, uh, who was um, Franklin's son's mother, things like that. Um, and I was reminded of, a, of an essay by Martin Buber who talks about when you read history, you have to have two points in history in mind at the same time, the, the time in which the story happens and the time in which the storyteller is writing. Um, can you talk a little bit about that whole process and how present day issues play in your head as you're writing about something in the past? Um, I just love coming to Port Washington because it's where someone mentions Martin Buber in a question. Thank <laughs> you. Um, two different things come to mind and remind me that I have a second if I don't get to it. Um, one of the problems with Cleopatra in particular, but it's a problem with John Adams as well in this book, is of course when, when the chronicler is writing about the history. And one of the problems with Cleopatra is, of course, very little is actually written, that we have today is written about her by her contemporaries. Almost everything comes later. And our best source is Plutarch, who I might point out is born 76, I think, years after Cleopatra dies, which puts him as close to Cleopatra as we are to Ulysses Grant. So our best source is not someone who, I mean, he's, he's really going so much on hearsay that accounts that he has are ones that are handed down by hearsay to his grandfather, when then get handed down to Plutarch. So you can imagine how accurate they might be. So part of my feeling with that book was that I had to keep reminding the reader that these are, first of all, all Roman men writing about a Greek woman, so they are by definition, anti anti they're, they're hostile to her in, in every way, but that they are also not contemporaneous. And who they were and who their agendas were and when they were writing plays a tremendous role in what they have to say. And I didn't feel like I could remind the reader of that often enough with something like Cleopatra. It comes up again, obviously, with something like this, where John Adams kept a diary, but he also writes later, which is his autobiography. And obviously, what he's writing later does not conform as much to the fact of the matter as what he's writing in real time. And separating those two is, you know, can, be, can be quite a, you know, a difficult matter. But you, and, and how, much you, how much you invest in the truth of each one of those depends obviously on when they were written. So I think there's, there's always a part of you that does keep that in mind. Um, to your point about topicality, on the one hand, I think you always hope that what you're writing is going to feel topical to your reader. I mean, this is a moment where you have a tremendous sense that people's rights are being infringed upon or people's voices are not being heard by their government and you have an explosion of media, and it can feel very much like us today. On the other hand, you hope that you're not writing with a kind of topical agenda, and that the time in which you are working is not too much informing what you're writing about, because then you end up with a very tendentious volume. So I think that's a very, I don't know how one weighs those two, but I think it's a constant concern. I think you don't want too much of what you're hearing and seeing in real time to seep into, the, into your account, but I also think it's unavoidable to some extent. So I'm going to just check in again. Is there any questions on Zoom? No, okay. We have another one here. The so side of the room is very quiet. <laughs> so I'm a uh, part-time resident in Pittsfield, Mass. And I have to tell you that the people in Pittsfield, Mass, look upon Adams as a backward, sleepy town with no reason to go to visit it when there's so many other things going on in the Berkshires in that area. And, and you're yet, you're not there anymore. <laughs> so and yet, here you came out of that town. <laughs> you haven't asked if I've gone back, though, have you? <laughs> so I'm wondering what influenced you to embark on this career, having come from that place. 
I, I, I'm not sure I can answer that in the time we have allotted, but lots of therapy might help. But I'll tell you, <laughs> I'll tell you one instructive story, which is the following. In the center of Adams, Massachusetts, um, is the Adams Free Library, which would seem to be the right thing to mention today. And the Adams Free Library was my second home. And I was never happier than I was in its hallways. But at a fairly early age, I had also exhausted the children's reading room at the Adams Free Library and found my way to the adult reading room. <coughs> where I was reading my way through some like mediocre novelist like A.J. Cronin or something, when Mrs. Toohey, the, the adult librarian, discovered me, must have been about 11, and decided that I should not be in the adult reading room, and by the scruff of my neck, picked me up and tossed me out, and then called my parents and reprimanded them for letting me be in the adult reading room. From this, I, and I was a very shy child. This was the worst thing that had ever happened to me. But I feel like my entire career has been revenge on Mrs. <laughs> Tooley. <laughs> because I just wanted to, I don't know what she was trying to keep from me, but I wanted to get back there. <laughs> OK, so we have time for maybe one or two more. Mine is just a, a specific tidbit from the beginning of the book. Um, did you, when you said that, when uh, Samuel Adams was at Harvard, they made him translate things out of Latin into English and then back into Latin again? Is how, how did they get them to translate it back into Latin without them cheating? I mean, wouldn't they have, have had the original <laughs> text or were they shared in the library? I don't know how they did it without, I think there was probably a fair amount of cheating because if you look at the infractions, and actually Thomas Hutchinson, I think at one point, is fined for cheating because he had had like either his Latin or his, or his Greek notes inside the text. It's an assignment that's very similar to the one that Ben Franklin used when he taught himself how to write, where he would try to take something out of Addison and then rewrite it as Addison. It's exactly that same exercise. And it's, it's actually, I don't know if you've ever done it, it's a fairly interesting exercise to see if you, if you can then retranslate it to precisely the same language you've used th that you saw the first time around. The Harvard stuff was fascinating because they have the doctoral theses, as you know from the early part of the book, what is preoccupying the colonial mind, the questions that these young men are asking themselves, these young men who will become the leaders of, of the Massachusetts elite, are shockingly, on the one hand, familiar, right? I mean, is, you know, do you meet your friends in heaven? And shockingly far off in time. I mean, is, Christ, is, is the Pope the Antichrist? You know, these, cra these crazy sounding questions. But it, it's so instructive to me of how much has changed about education and how little has changed as well. Okay, we're gonna take one last question. This is a two-part question. First of all, you hinted at this a number of times in the book about how Adams might have made a living where he got his money and who paid for the, in your opinion, how did he really make a living? And two, since he was writing every night for the magazines or, or I should say newspapers and attending meetings during the day, what was his family life like? What was the relationship with his children and his wife? Those are such great questions. Um, I did an event recently with John Hancock's biographer. There's a new book out about John Hancock. And my single burning question for her was, it was, was it John Hancock who was actually underwriting Samuel Adams all these years? He's clearly, the answer to your question is he's living on handouts. Um, at one point he's a tax collector, as you know, and deeply, deeply in debt. And a bunch of people chip in to help buy off his debt, to help relieve him of the debt. And there's one anonymous individual who pays a huge amount of money, and I can't imagine that was anyone other than John Hancock, which would could also explain some of the resentments between the two men. And there's a sort of fairy tale story in the book about Adams being dressed for Congress because Massachusetts didn't want to send him to Philadelphia looking like the shabby Samuel Adams whom they knew so well, and these sort of, you know, the tailor, the shoemaker, the wig maker, everyone appears at his doorstep sent by some anonymous benefactor to dress him. And I'm assuming that that is the work of John Hancock. But that's a guess on my part. We don't, we don't really know. He's very close with his children. Um, the one piece that went, goes missing from the documentation is that there apparently was a memoir of him written by his daughter, which is supposed to be with his papers, and it's no longer there. Um, but he's very close with her. He sees carefully to her education. She's immensely well-read. Um, she's very dutiful and very loving in her letters to him, as is he to her. With the son, it's a more cloud. It's it's, on, it's a little bit less clear, but he's a very present parent, and he brings up those children for seven years without a wife between marriages. His first wife dies. He's for seven years a bachelor, and that's extremely unusual, both for him to have been a single parent and for him to have waited 
so long. I think Paul Revere goes something like five months between his marriages. So. Well, okay then. So uh, thank you all for your questions. You. Um, I, I just want to wrap up by saying, uh, Stacy, that this is a tremendous book. Um, it's so accessible and engaging. Your writing style it ha has wit. Uh, it's clearly well researched, and so I recommend the, or commend this book uh, to all of you. Um, thank you so much thank for being you, here John. with us. Thank this you all. Nice. Thank you so much.